coming up on News Team, we give you an update on Syrian refugees coming into the country. All 129 Paris victims have been identified. DIA's new hotel opens to the public. And how to stay safe this Thanksgiving. News Team Boulder starts right now. From the Roser Atlas Center and the College of Media, Communication and Information at the University of Colorado Boulder, this is News Team Boulder. Hello and welcome to your Thursday edition of News Team Boulder. I'm Jane O'Connor. And I'm Anastasia Young. Today, it was confirmed through fingerprint analysis that the leader behind the Paris attacks was killed in a police raid. French prosecutor's office said Abdelhamid Aboud was killed during a seven-hour siege. Eight other suspects were arrested during the raid. There are still many unanswered questions regarding Aboud's actions and what is in store. France is looking to extend its state of the emergency for three months. Here at News Team, we also want to recognize the 129 victims who died in the attack today. French authorities announced that all 129 people killed in Friday's terrorist attacks in Paris have been identified. People of all ages, religions, and backgrounds were targeted, although the majority of victims ranged from age 20 to 40, a strikingly young demographic. Around 100 families have gone to see and identify the bodies of their loved ones who were killed. With at least 350 injured in the attacks, the death toll is still rising due to many in serious condition. This year, the University of Colorado has hosted and produced its highest number of exchange students. CU sent almost 2,000 students abroad in the 2013-14 school year and housed upwards of 2,500 international students. Despite the devastating events in Paris, none of the five University of Colorado students abroad in Paris have decided to come back. CU is recommending that they report to the university staff when they travel on the weekends and to stay safe. While the terrorist attacks in Paris are devastating, other parts of the world are also experiencing terrorism. A Russian passenger jet that crashed in Egypt last month, killing more than 200, is now believed to be an act of terrorism. A new image of the bomb has surfaced, hidden in this soda can. ISIS has claimed responsibility for downing the Russian airliner. Shifting to Nigeria, bomb attacks have shaken the cities of Yola and Kano in the span of 24 hours. At least 30 were killed and 72 injured and involved an 11-year-old female bomber who played a role in the attack. As Nigeria respond oh, excuse me. As, as Nigeria <laughs> responds to the acts of terror, Nigerian President Buhari tweeted, "The enemies of humanity will never win. Hand in hand, we will rid our land of terrorism." The response resonates with many of the acts of terrorism happening around the globe. Now we turn our attention to Paris and the attacks on Friday. That's right, Annie. And Syrian refugees are seeking out help in the U.S. But an increase in screening could make it harder for them to gain entry into the states. 31 governors are not in support of letting Syrian refugees in the country after the Paris attacks last week. As more Syrians are trying to gain access to the United States, governors around the country are concerned with the Syrian refugees in the aftermath of the Paris terrorist attacks. At least one of the Paris attackers pretended to be a Syrian refugee in order to enter Europe and later take part in the attack Friday that led to deaths of over 120 people. 31 Republican governors want to put a halt on Syrian refugees until the screening process is improved. But President Obama says he will veto that bill if it is put on his desk. They are already under much more scrutiny. Uh, and, and so my expectation is after the initial uh, spasm of, of rhetoric, uh, the people will settle down, take a look at the facts, uh, and we'll be able to proceed. Already, Texas has the most Syrian refugees of any other state with just over 7,000, followed by California, New York, Michigan, and Florida. But... Those numbers are expected to go up. Obama has called to welcome 10,000 refugees to the United States next year. Colorado was one of only 18 states to accept Syrian refugees without extended screening. Governor John Hickenlooper says it is not the governor's legal duty to decide who enters their state. 
and 60% of American voters say that they don't want the U.S. to open its borders to the refugees. We'll keep an eye on the story and keep you posted about it as it develops further. Meanwhile, in Colorado, a missing teen has been returned home. A 14-year-old girl who ran away from her mom's on-campus apartment on Sunday morning has been found safe. CU Police issued a release Tuesday asking for the public's help in locating Cora Isabel Breitver. CU Police tweeted yesterday morning that she had been found. Police have not said when or where she was found. The public can officially check in to the new Weston Hotel at the Denver International Airport tomorrow. The massive building, shaped like the wings of a bird or a whale's tail, others claim, will contain 519 guest rooms and a 37,000 square foot conference center. By April, the RTD light rail will be connecting the hotel and airport to Union Station in downtown Denver. You can stay at the hotel starting at $189 a night. Boomtown Boulder has announced the state's first health tech accelerator. The accelerator helps a handful of selected Colorado startups get guidance, support, and money for projects focused on healthcare technologies. Boomtown launched its startup accelerator programs in 2013 and has since graduated more than 30 companies. These health programs are increasing globally, with another accelerator starting in the United Kingdom yesterday. Boulder may be overtaking Silicon Valley as the startup capital of the country. Boulder's startup scene kicks off today with a special entrepreneurial conference. News team's Maria Bond takes a closer look. Today marks a very special day for up-and-coming entrepreneurs in the Boulder area, as it's the official kickoff day of NewCo Boulder this year. One of the local businesses being featured in this year's event is the Organic Sandwich Company, located right here on Pearl Street. You've got this dream and this idea and you put it down on paper, but until you actually execute it, you have no idea. What makes NewCo truly unique is the space it creates for up-and-coming entrepreneurs. Instead of gathering in a formal venue, the city's local founders and entrepreneurs invite the public to their own businesses to share their inside knowledge. Boulder is such a collaborative community and people want to help each other. And the people who are attending this function can learn so much, for example, from Marcy, who has the organic sandwich shop. NUCO is a national movement taking place across the country, such as LA, Chicago, and Portland. It's just a wonderful thing for our community to help people grow in their own businesses and collaborate with each other. If you're interested in the entrepreneurial inside scoop, but you're not looking to pay that registration fee, remember NUCO is always looking for volunteers. Reporting to you from News Team, I'm Maria Bond. The University of Colorado Hospital performed its first heart and kidney transplant on November 7th. When Sam Johns had a heart attack in February, it also ruined his kidneys. There are 44 people in Colorado who are waiting for a heart transplant and almost 2,000 for a kidney transplant. Johns was in and out of hospitals and on the wait list for his transplants until he found his heart and kidney from the same donor. Kidney surgeon Dr. Peter Keneally said that it couldn't have gone any better and it was really great. Boulder elects a new mayor and previous mayor Bat Matt Applebaum <laughs> says goodbye to his role. The city of Boulder has approved improvements for the city's culture. Nathan Elgren has the story after the break. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. On Tuesday, the Boulder City Council met and discussed the issue of occupancy limits. The new housing ordinance, depending on zoning, bans more than three to four unrelated persons to a home. 
Although the ordinance will not make current legal situations illegal, many are upset and believe it shouldn't be illegal to fill all of the rooms in a home. The ordinance will also be raising fines for the first offense from $150 to $500. Occupancy regulations continue to be a hot topic in Boulder after receiving an anonymous complaint against one of the city's better known illegal cooperatives. Boulder officials say they won't enforce occupancy limits. Or Suzanne Jones was elected as the new mayor of Boulder on Tuesday. The mayor of Boulder is chosen by the nine council members and last week the executive director of EcoCycle expressed to her colleagues that she would like to be considered for the position over Matt Applebaum. She believes that after the recent election season, a message needs to be sent to the community that they can achieve change and evolve as a community. New money towards recycling improvements are paving the way for a greener boulder. Upgrades in the county's proposed 2016 budget will set aside $3 million to update the 15-year-old recycling facility. The modifications are part of a goal to update outdated equipment due to changing technologies. The improvements will cut costs in the long run and make buildings more energy efficient. The City Council has engaged in a series of sessions that ended to find solutions to the current parking situations throughout Boulder. The overall desire is that Boulder residents will make as few journeys as possible by car. Not only to reduce the carbon footprint, but due to the lack of space Central Boulder has for parking. Parking permits and meter costs as well as more comprehensive RTD routes are issues that will be in effect when the council comes to an agreement. Yesterday marked day three of the Community Food Share's Let's Bag Hunger Food Drive. With almost 4,000 pounds of food coming in yesterday, the total was brought up to 19,500 pounds. The 2015 drive is well on its way to reaching its goal of 60,000 pounds of food. The drive will go until November 25th and is accepting donations at grocery stores in Boulder, Gun Barrel, Niwot, Broomfield, Lafayette, and Louisville. The first business meeting of the newly elected Boulder City Council happened on Tuesday night, where they unanimously approved the Community Cultural Plan, which seeks to strengthen Boulder's arts community in our coming years. Our own Nathan Elgren has more on how this plan will benefit local artists. On Tuesday, Boulder City Council approved a new community cultural plan, which will strengthen Boulder's arts community in coming years. Now behind me is the Dairy Center for the Arts, one of Boulder's largest art complexes, where productions in dance, film, theater, and the visual arts happen year round. 9% of Boulder residents earn their living in a creative profession. Over the last year, 2,000 community members from school boards and art organizations have been contributing ideas and mutual goals toward this new community cultural plan, which is the first of its kind in almost a decade. It's pretty significant. It's a nine-year plan, uh, which has scaled funding going up over the course of those nine years, that, which will more than I think quadruple our funding over the course of that nine-year period. Check-ins on the plan will happen every three years to see if goals like establishing creative venues and engaging youth in art opportunities are continuing to be met. Just having a really concrete kind of reinvigorating the arts and culture scene in the city of Boulder, which we have a reputation for, but it's been neglected over the course of you know, a number of years, and it's been hard. It's been a struggle for artists and people to live in this community because it's uh, so expensive. In the 2017 election cycle, a group of Boulder artists are planning to write a ballot issue that will fund arts programs in the city. From the Dairy Center for the Arts, I'm Nathan Elgren with News Team Boulder. If you were outside in Boulder yesterday, you might have been blown away by the wind. Gusts of up to 100 miles per hour were a problem for cars on the road. A semi-truck blew over at the intersection of C-470 and I-70 yesterday, causing the left lane of westbound I-70 and causing tr delays in traffic. It also caused power outages throughout the city. Almost 1,000 Boulder customers lost power near Arapahoe Avenue and another 800 near 28th and Iris. Excel says most of the outages didn't last long. In Golden and Lakewood, just up the road, 17,000 people had no electricity for most of the morning. However, power was restored to homes and businesses several hours later. Well, clearly it's been an extremely windy week, but coming up, Jess will let us know what's going on with the other elements in the weather. Yeah, what's going on there, Jess? Yeah, that's right, Anastasia and Jane. Things are starting to cool down before fall break. More weather coming up. Ah, uh, it's a great day, isn't it? Yeah. Too bad your boat's gonna sink at 
Don't come closer. I have rabies. Don't you wish there were warnings to protect you from life's risks? With diabetes, there is one. It's called A1C, a simple blood test that helps measure your risk of serious complications. Learn more at diabetesa1c.org. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this is probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool, really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Moltnick, and this is News Team Weather. For your current conditions, it's about 44 degrees, and it feels more like 40 with some scattered clouds in the sky. There is a 0% chance of precipitation, and winds are coming in from south-southeast at about 5 miles per hour, a little less harsh than yesterday's gusts. Now let's take a look at the whole state. For those of you preparing to fly out a little early for fall break, DIA has a high of 44 degrees and a low of 20, and a pretty clear sky moving over to the Denver metro area. The temperature is about the same, 45 and a low of 22. Up north in Broomfield, they're having a pretty good day with a high of 55 degrees and a low of 23. Heading to the mountains in the Evergreen area, has a high of 42 and a low of 21. Conifer will just gets up to 38 today with a low of 19. Moving out to the rest of the state, or the country rather. The Miami area has some rough conditions. 80 degrees, ladies and gentlemen, only 80. And up to the Carolinas, oh goodness grief. Um, new, and north to New York, they have pleasant high of 61 degrees, but as we move west, things start to get a little chilly. Omaha and uh, has highs of 36 degrees, and if you think it's cold in Boulder today, take a look at Rapid City, Nebraska. It's freezing, literally. Highs there around 17 degrees today. I'm sure many of you will be vacationing out there. And then in the Los Angeles area, they're in the mid-50s. Now, remember that little storm that passed through Colorado earlier this week? Well, it made its way over to Kansas. Residents of Colby, Kansas woke up yesterday to 20, yes, 20 inches of snow. That's nearly two feet of the white fluffy stuff. National Guard teams were out all day patrolling and plowing the roads, searching for any stranded drivers. Storms seem to be in fashion this week over in Atlanta and Coweta County, Georgia. These cities encountered a tornado Wednesday, causing quite a bit of damage to buildings, cars, and the land. Trees were ripped out of the ground and scattered along the highways. Residents are still working to clean things up. Now looking ahead to the next few days, it is definitely getting colder. Tomorrow we stay about the same as today with a high of 47 and a low of 16. It will be mostly cloudy with just a 20% chance of precipitation and winds of up to 17 miles per hour, which will make it feel even colder. On Saturday again, we see that drop in temperature down to 43 degrees with a low of 24. And come Sunday, we will get a little boost in degrees with a beautiful day of 51 and sunny. I hope the weather will be a little warmer for the football team in Washington, Vinny. Yeah, Jess, the Buffs are gonna to need to get on a hot streak to finish out this season. I'll break it all down for you on Sports Next. Mom! Mom! What? You can't find Ichabod. What? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, how was your weekend? Uh, oh, have you seen it for John? Oh, yeah. Uh <laughs> Pay attention. 
Hi, I'm Vincent Arby. And here's what's going on in sports. The Buffs travel to Pullman this weekend to take on the Washington State Cougars, who are coming off of a last second win against the UCLA Bruins. The Buffs are still trying to rebound after coming up just short to the Trojans last week. Let's go to the board. The Buffs currently have a 4-7 record and 1-6 in, in Pac-12 play, while the Cougars are 7-3 with a 5-2 record in the conference. With Cepho down, the Buffs look to Cade Apsay, who was making his first career start after coming into the game in relief last week. Apsay is 25 for 44 on the season with two touchdowns and one interception. He will be countered by Luke Falk, who is making his way onto the Heisman watch list with 4,067 yards passing and 35 touchdowns. The Cougars rank third in passing yards, averaging about 414.4 points, points per game, while the Buffs are ranked 38th with 239.3 yards per game. The Buffs will look to pound the ground game as well, which is something the Cougars don't really do that much. You can watch the game this Saturday on ESPN2 at 8.45 local time. The men's and women's cross country teams are headed to Louisville, Kentucky this weekend for the national championship. The men's team is looking for a three-peat after winning the event the past two seasons. They are currently the favorites and are ranked number one after sweeping the Pac-12 and NCAA regional meets. Syracuse and Stanford are ranked second and third and look to put up a fight against the Buffs. Head coach Mark Wetmore said, I think Syracuse is a very, very good and I think Stanford is very, very good. And either one of those teams can beat us if they have a good day and we're a little off. The women's team is currently ranked second and is hoping to make a splash at the national title. They haven't won a national title since 2004, but feel like they have a good shot this year. They will have to take on a, on a tough New Mexico team who is currently ranked number one and rested two of their top seven runners at the regionals to save them for this weekend. It looks to be a good weekend of racing out in Louisville. The women's basketball teams plays tonight at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time against the Northern Colorado Bears. The Buffs hope to get a win before they hit the road and, and, and head to Lexington to play the Kentucky Wildcats on, on Sunday. Head coach Linda Lappy is one victory away from reaching 100 wins as the Colorado head coach. The Buffs look to freshman Kennedy Leonard to lead the team after she scored 18 points and 8 assists in their last contest. The Buffs have a 10-6 all-time record against the Bears and are currently riding a seven-game streak against them. The Colorado men's basketball team has its home opener tomorrow night against Portland at 7 on Pac-12 Network. The Buffs are coming off of a 91-84 point win against the Auburn Tigers on Tuesday, in which eight different Buffs played at least 16 minutes and all had contributions. George King led the Buffs with 27 points and seven rebounds in the game. The Buffs hope to keep the wins coming as they open a five-game homestand. Let's take you out to Phoenix where the Bulls are taking on the Suns. We start off early in the game with the Bulls leading by 11. When the ball bounces straight through Joakim Noah's legs and straight to Jimmy Butler who hits the fadeaway. Here it is again. Jimmy Butler for three, or two. <laughs> it's still Jimmy Butler's game when he hits a three to take the Bulls up by seven points. Later in the fourth with the Bulls trailing, oh wait, Brandon Knight gets a little fancy, does what he does and shoots a two. Where am I, where am I at? Later in the buff with the Bulls trailing by one, Paul gets the ball and does his thing and drives in for the slam to give the Bulls back the lead with two minutes left. Jimmy Butler gets the ball and he hits the jumper to bring the Bulls back lead back to six points. That would be all for the Suns as they can never recover and the Bulls would take the lead, take the game 103 to 97. Here's a play that you guys have got to see. Late in the game with Toronto Raptors trailing the Utah Jazz, DeMar DeRozan drives past Gordon Hayward and completely posterizes Rudy Gobert. Here it is again as DeRozan just has no regard for human life and shows that he's the man and he doesn't care what anybody thinks. This will definitely be on a fathead sometime in the future. Whoa, all this talk about sports is making me hungry for some Thanksgiving food. Jane, what's your favorite part of Thanksgiving? <laughs> I have mashed potatoes and stuffing already. Absolutely, those, those mashed potatoes get me every time. Well guys, Sasha has some info about how to make sure your Thanksgiving meals are as safe as they are delicious. We'll see you after the break.
a fever. I am a fever. I am a fever. I ain't born typical. Well, holiday season is officially here as Thanksgiving is coming up next week. Many students may be trying their hand in the kitchen for the first time this Thanksgiving, but things can become pretty serious if the turkey isn't cooked properly. Exactly, and did you guys know that November and December have the highest number of food poisoning outbreaks? 92% of those outbreaks come from meat and poultry, according to the Center for Disease Control. A trick to ensure a properly cooked and delicious turkey is to soak the bird in brine, which is a mixture of water, salt, sugar, and a variety of herbs, for at least 12 hours before putting the turkey in the oven. When the leaves begin to turn colors and eventually fall into crisp piles on the ground, holiday season is right around the corner, starting with Thanksgiving. But do keep a few things in mind when putting your culinary skills to the test. Well, probably the most important thing is to make sure it's cooked all the way through. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to undercook a bird. Um, you could get yourself sick and uh, probably all your family members sick and not have such a good enjoyable holiday. Sean Merle is a culinary manager at Alpha Alphas and says it's crucial to always take a temperature before you serve the turkey. The important part is making sure that you fully get down to the bone um, because that's going to be the last portion of the bird that's going to finish cooking since it cooks from the outside in. Um, you're probably looking at more like five or six hours if you're doing it at home in a conventional oven. If you need some more direction, don't hesitate to visit cdc.gov for some more holiday safety cooking tips. Also, make sure that whenever you're touching any raw meat, you use some of these and change them often to avoid any cross-contamination. Yeah, and I'm sure a big part of that, too, is just making sure you wash your hands. That's right. Keep it safe and keep it delicious this Thanksgiving. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Boulder rang in the holiday season with the Snow Much Fun event on Tuesday. 200,000 LED lights decorated the trees and grounds of Boulder Central Park where two Denver Broncos kicked off the lighting event. The lights vary from green to white to blue and will be a beautiful spectacle for the Boulder community till January 3rd. Well, that's exciting. I'll definitely want to check that out. Oh, definitely. I think they have definitely a lot of lights displayed out there. So, Yeah, this whole segment is really getting me in the mood uh, for the holidays. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? I'm just spending time with the family. I think I'm headed out to San Francisco, actually, so it should be a good break. What about you? Um, I'm heading home to Boston on Friday, but that is all we have for today. So <laughs> thank you, guys, and we will see you next time on News Team Boulder. I'm Jane O'Connor. And I'm Anastasia Young. Thanks for tuning in. This isn't where you want to be. Don't use a fake ID. They said I would be more focused. They said I'd get better grades. It's nothing like they told me. It's not what you expected. Don't abuse prescription drugs.